What's up, Phil? Hey, how's it going? I'm doing well. How are you today? Uh, just adding Zoom to my phone. I thought I had it done before, but I didn't. So remembering passwords and such. Ah, well, there you go. Looking good, man. You're you're checking in from ah. Dublin, California, or I am. I am. I'm at the um, doing the the weekly ordering at my bar right now. So, all right, all right. Surrounded by bar? surrounded by booze. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. What's the name of the bar, Phil? Uh, it's called the Back Lounge in Dublin, California. Back Lounge. Okay. All right. Um, I spent enough time in the hospitality industry to really respect what you're doing right now. So <laughs> right on. There you go. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, but I'm Kevin. Nice to meet you. Hey. Welcome. All right, Kevin. What's up? What's up? What's up? Yeah. Buffalo, New York. We're here in Buffalo. Any memories of Buffalo from years past? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Buffalo. I remember on violence's very first bus tour we did, uh, we had, were so excited to be in our first bus and um, it was an LA based bus and the Raiders were playing in LA at that time. This was in 1990, I think. And uh, the, at the top of the bus, they had all the LA, you know, UCLA, USC, you know, Rams, they had the Raiders up there and we we're big Raider fans, you know? So I'd always scroll it up and put it on the Raiders. And uh, there was a big Sunday night game against the Raiders and the, uh, the bills back then. And, you know, buff, the bills were on fire back then. That was Kelly and Andre Reed and all those guys, Thurman Thomas. And uh, the Raiders were undefeated. They were coming in, and and we had pulled into town, and the the bus says the Raiders on it. We pulled by this construction site, man, and all these construction workers just threw all their coffee cups and all their trash at our bus. They <laughs> thought we were the team coming in, you know, but pretty fun. Damn. Well, um, right off the bat, cheers. I got some liquid uh, liquid death here. Happy Valentine's Day to you, man. <laughs> all right, man. <laughs> liquid death, Valentine's Day. And, yeah, uh, Buffalo Sabres hat. Yep, you know it, Buffalo Sabres. Even though we're a little iffy, iffy. Um, did you see the was, Super Bowl last night? I watched it. Yeah, I did. Yeah, the Rams, man, pulling it, pulling it away. Yeah, yeah. It was. Uh, I was. I was rooting for. I'm a Raider fan, so I was rooting for. I wanted the Bengals to win it. You know, you always want the team that knocked you out to win it all, so they beat everybody. You know, but it was a good game. I didn't really care either way too much. Okay. Yeah. So you're still a Raiders fan, even though they're in Vegas. Absolutely. Yeah. What else am I going to do? <laughs> All right. Just check in. Well, cool. Uh, I'd like to start off with the fact of the day here. We got Phil Demmel of violence here. Uh, what an, what an honor for me. The number one. Oh. Yeah. I, I mean it. The number one, the number one song um, in America in 1987 was living on a prayer by Bon Jovi. I'm sure that's, <laughs> I'm sure that's pretty uh, one of your go-to karaoke songs. I don't know. Were you a were you a fan of the hair metal scene back when? Any of the rap? I was Motley Crue. I was right? man. I was. I loved you know because that was kind of still early enough to where you know Dokken was early mid mid '80s and you know I loved all the guitar players. I loved Dee Martini, a Rat, and you know George Lynch, one of my favorite guys. And um, I enjoyed the songs, man. I love a great a great melody and. Didn't really get into the poison when it came out. It was just a little bit too over the top for me in that sense. But love Motley Crue, man, and um, a lot of that stuff. I think that, you know, my I've got a cover band of all my high school buddies, and we do the Bon Jovi songs. We do the Rat songs, you know, so it's uh, a lot of fun. We dig it a lot. Yeah, it's a really fun style of music, that's for sure. And uh, I had to ask that. But today's quote... I kept it, uh, I wanted to include the word love in there. So the first lyric that came to mind with the word love and, and for me was a quote from the Beatles, the end, uh, all the love you take is equal to the love you make. And oh, uh, all right. yeah, Mastodon brought that line back. Uh, my boys in Mastodon in a song called The Hunter, all the love you make is equal to the love you take. So I agree with that, you know, what yeah. you get out. Tesla, Tesla was, you know, kind of, Kind of along the same lines too, what you give. Yeah, and, and rat too, you know, because it's so easy to forget. You know, <laughs> the villain in the villain in Star Wars is Boba Fett. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah, Zet. That's so. Me and me and Zet when we'd cruise around, you know, in the mid '80s, and I had that. I love that. You know, it's that's the uh, 
That's uh, uh, Invasion Privacy, the second yeah, one. Yeah, Invasion, the one would lay it down on it, right? And, and uh, but me and Zet would drive around and listen to that, and that's what he would, I could never forget that, you know? It's easy, easy to forget the villain in Star Wars is Boba Fett. That's hilarious, man. I thought you just came <laughs> up with that right now. Wow, that's awesome. No, I did. That's Zet from the 80s. From here on Zet. out. Every time you hear that song, I'm just going to see Boba go. Fett and Darth Vader. Oh, that's yeah. cool. Well, yeah, Phil Demel of Violence right here, right now. Uh, March the 4th is a pretty big day. We got the Let the World Burn EP dropping. And, uh, yes. you know, you're back with your, your buddy, Sean Killian, and, and the guys in Violence. And uh, the last time you released a record, 1993. You know, this episode is I Asked No One, episode 93, kind of for a reason there. Um, oh, wow. How was it? Was it like riding a bike uh, with these guys returning in the studio? I think that, you know, in the beginning, it was just about playing a few shows and seeing if we could play some shows and where we are on that and sticking our sticking our big toe in the cold water and see if it, you know, something that we could that we could handle doing. And we did. And it, and it took a while to progress to thinking about doing new music and making sure that the interest was there, of course, you know. I don't know how many people really gave a shit back in the day, you know, otherwise, <laughs> you know, we probably still might still be playing, but you know, it's, it's nice to nice that people are interested and uh, it got me and Sean and the dudes interested in writing again, going, Hey, that there might be, you know, I didn't want to do a full, full length. I don't think that we had the energy or the, the focus to really do that. <laughs> But doing the, I wanted to do three or four and turned into five songs. And um, it was, it was nothing like back in the day. It was, it was different in the sense that, you know, all adults now and uh, I've been playing music pretty constant, but some of the guys haven't. And so it was getting, getting some dudes up to speed and getting them to understand like recording nowadays is different. And um you know, trying to, at the end of the day, you want something quality too. So trying to get something that, that, that we are all happy with and that, you know, that we would feel comfortable in putting out. I didn't want to put out, you know, just, oh, let's just throw out some songs and go play some shows or whatever. I wanted it to be, you know, I had a statement to make, you know, and coming, coming out of what I came out of and wanted to, wanted to make it, you know, I wanted it to be perfect, man. Yeah. Yeah, we can't wait to dive into that fucking EP. I already released a song off of it, lyric video, so I'll include a link below to that. Um, you said it was really different compared to the 80s and, and the early 90s when you were there. How was it working with Sean Killian and writing music? I mean, did you draw inspiration from being in the same room together still, or was did you have to pull it from you know movies or the past few years, the bullshit that's happened? I think that... I think that I had enough inspiration just listening to the, the first record again and wanting to kind of conjure up all those feelings that I had as a teenager writing that record. And, and I did, you know, it felt, it felt good to write a thrash record, just unabashed thrash record, you know, and, and not have to worry about any, anything other than, than that. I think that, you know, playing with these guys, uh, playing with Perry, uh, such high energy and um, quick, quick hands and opening the doors to these, these different things that, you know, to different stuff. And, you know, Sean has always been this unique um, partner in writing and, and that he's, he's not conventional and at all. There's nothing conventional about how he writes or, or his phrasing or his structures or his ideas at all. So he brings this weird, you know, not even left field. It's like the parking lot ideas of, of things that, that can happen. So, you know, it's uh, different in a sense that there isn't that, that youthful, I don't want to say confidence, but that, you know, maybe just being naive in, in the sense of how things work. Well, now we're pretty jaded and we're pretty, you know, uh, we know kind of what the deal and we, and we know that we're writing for ourselves, which hasn't happened in a long time. You know, it hasn't happened since that first record. So ever, ever since after that, it's been 
you know, the second record was written, well, hey, let's be more like Testament because they got the tour bus and they're, you know, start writing different shit like that. So it's always been different since that first record. Yeah. And one of those bands, you know, you mentioned Testament and in 1988, the year I was born, uh, Eternal Ooh. Nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, there's two of us. I have an identical twin brother in Athens, Greece. So shout out oh, to right Ryan. Awesome. Yeah. Hey, what's up, Ryan? <laughs> Fuck yeah, man. Um, yeah, so Eternal Nightmare in 88, but uh, Sean Killian, you know, our one of your buddies, Ted Aguilar of Death Angel, he has a podcast called Alive and Streaming, and I had him on. It was a fun chat, but he had Sean Killian on his show, and I could tell he was a little uh, uh, starstruck, maybe uh, really, <laughs> you know, a little quieter, like real showed his respect. Um, I'm trying to contain myself now. Oh, my God. But, <laughs> But uh, Sean Killian, is there one word to describe? <laughs> I don't know if there's one. I don't know if I can describe it in one. Um, uh, I don't think I can, man. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, you sounded pretty uncompromising and unconventional by the way you're you're describing him and. I think that uncompromising is is a is a pretty good adjective for Sean Killian. Okay. Yeah, I think un uncompromising. <laughs> Very good. That's the that's that's the way right there, man. No no pun intended to to yeah. the Lorian. That's the way. That's the way. <laughs> but yeah, man, metal is alive and well. The year's twenty twenty two, and you got this mm -hmm. new EP coming out soon. And uh, you know, my friends at Gojira, they had the Fortitude come out. Uh, mm -hmm. your, your pals in Exodus, <coughs> Persona Non Grata. I mean, you listen to that record, holy shit. You know, KK's Priest with, with KK Downing, previous guest, what he's doing, and Maiden with Senjutsu and fucking Corn. My boys in Corn just came out with their new record. So it's oh. really in it, Impera with Ghost. Ghost have new, new, their new record coming out in March. So what is, uh, what is exciting you the most about the release of? you know, your record that you, you put all this blood and sweat into. <laughs> it was a lot of work, man. There was a lot of work put into this. Um, I, you know, having it released, I've, I've played it for a lot of my friends and a lot of people that I respect and they've all dug it a lot, which means a lot. But again, um, I, you hear the story of, of Dime when he finished listening to uh, Vulgar, which is one of my favorite records of all time you know there's this description of him just you know in tears a little bit welling up and just going it's perfect man you know it's perfect and that's that's what i wanted from this i wanted i i put every riff every drum roll every beat every you know every piece of the structure of these songs i went through so many different parts because i wanted them to be perfect and at the end of the day i wanted it to be to be able to walk away from that not not wanting the five stars or the ten ten you know, the 10 bananas or whatever, fucking, you know, I, I wanted to be just so okay and, and so good with, with what we created in those five songs. I didn't want to do 10. I think that it just gets diluted. I think that these five songs represent what we're all about at this, at this juncture, you know, and uh, I am, of course, you know, any artist, most artists i would have to say that 99.9 .9 of them are they want their art to be appreciated or or enjoyed or or loved or whatever and and i'm you know i'm no exception to that i i want people to dig it and be into it and uh, so having it being released on this on this scale tracy and brian and you know and everybody over there it's been you know such a such a great great experience so yeah. Oh, yeah, can't wait. Let the world burn. EP. Um, did you draw some inspiration too from the past few years that of being stuck inside? Uh, you know how how have your family? How's your family been the past you know few years? You guys doing all right? Yeah, we're good. I yeah. mean, I think that being sheltered in place, you know, is what brought us into the studio. It's like we've got we can't gay, we can't do anything. Let's concentrate and finish this record up and get in the studio and do it you know i did a record with uh bobby blitz and mike portnoy and mark mangy we did the bpmd record 
before we recorded it before it all went down but then we still decided to put it out you know it's just like what are we going to do sit on this record people are going to listen to it you know we're not really we're not a touring band let's just put it out and let have the music t- for people to enjoy so violence took the same approach like let's let's create this and you know get it recorded while we're focused and able to do this uh, my family me and my wife own a bar so um we were shut down from march to september of 20 and uh that was rough man it was not knowing what was going to happen and being told different things and then oh you can be out open but you have to be outside and we're a bar so we're not a restaurant but you have to serve food so we had to couple with a caterer and bring a caterer in and like if you wanted a beer and a shot you still had to buy a meal like a bona fide meal you just not chips or so we're riding this wave of what's okay and what isn't okay and you know we're fortunate to get through it you know we we buckled down and and got creative with some things and a lot of businesses didn't make it man it's really we we feel really fortunate that we were able to to kind of pull through this and we had a great team working for us and worked hard and, and did it so um yeah we got it we got sick last august you know and and uh so we we were a couple of days we and the wife got the shot you know so we we uh had a couple of days of not feeling good and then we we're we we're better good good you know the way you're describing about the the opening of your restaurant and just you know persisting through that uh johnny chow of stone sour he's got yeah, his restaurant here. yeah yeah masuda chow's and uh you know i was working at a restaurant when it just started when the pandemic started and uh Right before the pandemic hit, I got into real estate. So that's kept oh. me busy. You know, people are buying yeah. things. That's for yeah. sure. So, dude, if, if I'm or any of our viewers are coming through Dublin or Northern California, that's the place to go hit it up, right? Yeah, man. Back lounge. Good beer got selection. Some pool tables, got some got some shuffleboards. We got 10 beers on tap. We've got, you know, we don't get crazy because the, the the locals love their staples, but we've got some IPAs. We got some, you know, um, Pool tables, shuffleboard. It's kind of a sports bar. I uh, got a dartboard here too. The jukebox goes crazy. It's a pretty eclectic crowd. So it could be hip hop, it could be country western, it could be rock, it could be, you know, whatever. You know, yeah, all walks, all walks of life come through here. All right. Well, I mean, you got a jukebox, pool table, darts, and some killer beers, man. Yep. You know, We're you good. may see two Sign of it. us uh something. <laughs> cool. Right on. Camp out there. Um yeah, going back to BPMD, what you mentioned with Bobby from Overkill and Mengi from Metal Allegiance and Mike Portnoy, man, that's you released that record in June of 2020. That's exactly mm-hmm. right. A few months into the pandemic. And uh, <laughs> there's 1970s songs, you know, there's it was, it was <laughs> called American Made, uh, Beer Drinkers, Hellraisers, uh, ZZ Top and uh, Wang Tang, Putang. Sweet Putang at Ted Nugent. Yeah, and then there's the uh, Tattoo Vampire, which I've never heard of that song by the Blue Oyster Cult. You're a Blue yeah. Oyster Cult fan. I was back then, yeah. I, I mean, I still am. I like they, There's albums that I liked, and uh, that was a song that we all picked two songs, and then there was two kind of band songs that we, we did uh, walk away from. Uh, is it? It's not Joe Walsh, but it's the band that he played in. I don't fucking know. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, uh american band by grand funk and uh so i picked uh dead or alive from or from uh van halen and the song tattooed vampire which was a song that i wanted uh violence to cover back in the day you know it had a had a pretty cool pretty cool groove to it and actually there's a, a riff in 12 gates justice off of the nothing to gain record that is pretty similar to the you know so I uh, always love that tune. Nice, man. Well, um, I'm thinking about Metallica, you know, with the Bay Area scene and everything and Blue Oyster Cult. They've covered some pretty cool Blue Oyster Cult songs. Maybe you've heard uh, Astronomy and Veteran of a Thousand Psychic Wars. And Metallica did that? Yes. yes. Oh, man, I didn't know that. Dude, yes. And uh, my favorite is, uh, uh, God, When a Blind Man Cries. I don't know that song. Okay, yeah, it's a it's a deep cut to B side or something, but I remember seeing uh, Rogue One and Darth Vader. You talk about Star Wars, Darth Vader hacking away all these guys, 
and we went to the bar and put on that song. So every time I hear that song, you know, when oh, the blind man. man cries, you know, Vader's fucking <laughs> down, right motherfuckers. But cool. yeah, uh, veteran of a thousand psychic wars. I'll email you uh, a cool performance of that. Yeah. Cool, cool. I love that record. The Fire of an Origin record is awesome. Is that the one with Don't Fear the Reaper? No, no, that's that's earlier. Uh, okay. It it has uh, this song called Joan Crawford is on there, which is killer. It was, it was my first concert in 1981. I saw that tour. It was uh, it was a day on the green, so it was like a festival. So Hart was headlining, Blue Esther Colt, uh, Pat Travers, Lover Boy, and at ten in the morning, uh, the second of five bands was uh ozzy osbourne with randy rhodes on the blizzard of oz tour oh shit so yeah that was my first show and but that was the tour that was the blue oyster cult tour fire of unknown origin that's dope and uh one thing i want to share with you about blue oyster cult lars ulrich was asked by rolling stone you know give us your 15 top this is recently give us your top 15 uh metal records and he mentioned um on your feet or on your knees live album oh wow yeah that's great yeah. yeah, and one adjective he used was it's a dense, you know, it's a dense record. So it, uh -huh. it is, that's a fun one. But yeah, man, I learned about violence through a picture of Jason Newsted back when I was a teenager. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was, uh, he was definitely high in it, um, looking very cliff with the denim, but he had this really cool looking violence, eternal nightmare album cover shirt or sweatshirt on. Sweatshirt, and, right. Yeah. You know, that was right around the time I think I was getting into like what they were covering. But Jason was really championing championing you guys back when. Did you get that? Yeah. that you did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We knew we knew him, and uh, um, he had he was wearing a shirt every night on that Justice tour. You know, it was pretty rad. And uh, so yeah, we know Jason still talk to him off and on, and uh, you know it was it was great how he he was really into us and like forced entry and all these kind of obscure thrash bands because we were we were a cult band we weren't you know not a lot of people knew about us yeah yeah well jason uh saw him in a solo group in mill valley in santa cruz a, a few years ago and uh got him a bottle of wine you know our favorite oh, cool. uh, my dad hosts a wine television show here in town and my younger brother's in oregon so uh he likes wine if ever you see him you know give him a nice bottle <laughs> right on California. and where are you at Buffalo, Buffalo, New York. Oh yeah, you're in Buffalo. So yeah, okay. Yep, yep. But I was in San Diego and Los Angeles and uh and that neck of the woods and Napa. Right, right, right. Yeah. Do cool. you like wine? Do you go to Napa at all or I don't. I'm not my wife does, but I don't. Okay. I'll go up and I'll go up and golf up there every once in a while. It's about an hour about an hour away. Okay. So there's some nice courses up there. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, but staying with Metallica here in the Bay Area scene, did you have any interaction with Lars and James back when they're all babies, you know, ride the lightning and, and those days? Not too much. You'd see James at some shows and we knew of each other and had some mutual friends. And I wasn't, I wasn't really close with, with, with I, I'd see James out at shows more. Uh, but Cliff was, uh, Sean actually went to high school with Cliff. And uh, I think they might have even played soccer when they were even younger, junior high school or something. But, you know, so Cliff was, uh, he lived in Castor Valley and that's where Sean grew up. That's where Dean, our bass player, Dean knew him well. And uh, so he came to a couple of violent shows. James, I got, I got James on video at one of our earlier shows, like going through the pit. Like there was like somebody pitting and he kind of was just kind of, he pitted a little bit, you know, this is like 1980 six you know super easy super early it's like you know master's about to come out and, um and kirk would come out you know kirk was tight with all the death angel guys and he'd come come to so, some shows but it was i think cliff was the closest connection sean wrote for him early dude you know uh but now not 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 as much i wasn't not in that that cool kid click back then wait well you're definitely fucking way cool man and <laughs> well, I, yeah i know him now but you know by the way yeah you, you have a legacy man you you guys you were there you did it you know and yeah. and uh there's definitely something to be said about that jeez i mean
But when you say James was pitting, was he just shoving motherfuckers in there? Or? No, there, you know, there wasn't a lot of people. There wasn't a lot of people in the pit. There was like, I think our manager was out there and I think he might have been walking to the bathroom or something and was just kind of maybe even making fun of our manager at the time, you know, just, but he just kind of came through real quick and I need to dig that up. Yeah. All right. And then puppets came out and that was just, I know it's been said enough times, just what a record that was, but yeah, for you know, sure. Cliff, Cliff Burton, he would have got rest of soul. He would have been 60 years old. So did Crazy, you, uh, right? yeah, man. Did, did Sean ever share a cool story or, you know, a interaction you personally had with him that stood out? Not really. I mean, not that I can think of. I mean, the dude was pretty, as far as I remember, pretty quiet, just pretty kind of, you know, pretty subdued in that sense. Not, not too crazy when I saw him or hung out. I'm sure Sean has some stories for sure, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, they just had their 40th anniversary and asked that was a hell of a good time. And uh, definitely wanted to ask you about some Metallica, but yeah. you know, you're in machine head and you joined the band in 2003, which is my first rock show was Oh three. And, my impressionable years as a 15 year old, there was a, a band shot and uh, I got to locate it. It was a band shot of you and the guys in machine head. I was like, that's scary. That is scary. <laughs> and I want to learn more about it. It's very, it's, it's interesting. And um, that's um, you, Metallica had you out of the magnetics, the death magnetic cycle. I mean, how was it uh, opening for them throughout the States for arenas? Uh, it was great, man. You know, yeah, it was a dream come true. It, it was, you know, from a band standpoint, you know, they let the Met Club in early. And so they have all the front, you know, all the front row was all the, the, the Met Club. And and they're, they're there to see not the opening band, that's for sure. You know, they're there to see Metallica. So you get a lot of, you get a lot of this and you, you're working hard. You're working that Metallica crowd hard. But I think we did pretty well of, of winning them over by the, you know, the end of our 45 minutes. So, uh, you know, playing the arenas was awesome. They're great, you know, awesome hosts. And, uh, you know, the catering was amazing. But you get to get to watch Metallica every night, man. And that was, you know, them. And when we opened for uh, Heaven and Hell, you know, we got to see, you know, Sabbath with Dio every night. That was fucking, those were the nights. Those were the two tours where we watched every night. You know, we were, we didn't care if the set list was the same. You know, Metallica is really good about switching up their set list and, the heaven and hell was the same set every night, but we didn't care. We're watching fucking Tony and Geezer and, and Dio and Vinny. And it was fucking awesome. Damn dude. You know, and uh, Dio, I remember he was really bouncing back with this cancer diagnosis and then got rest his soul. He passed away. Um, yeah. Did they teach you anything out there on the road that you, you, you carry to this day? You know, one thing that uh, I, I want to say that I kind of was inspired by Dio in the sense that, he would remember names and like our, our, you know, the band's wives and friends and stuff like that. And, you know, it was amazing in that sense. And I, and I started doing it and uh, machine head at our, at our meet and greets, we'd have 30 people a day, you know, and they would come through and I, you sign their stuff first and, I ask for their name and I put their name down and look at them. Okay. Bobby and Sue, or, you know, Charlie and ding dong, whatever, you know, and, and try to remember as we go to take pictures after come up to them and go, Hey, Derek, Hey, you know, and they, people are really, it means a lot when you remember their name or, you know, so I do 27, 28, sometimes 30 out of 30, most, most days, you know, so I got good at exercising my brain and remembering, you know, the names and the, and, you know, we'd be playing sometimes and I'd see him up front and I'd go, Hey, you know, Susie, what's up? You know, and they'd go, Oh my God. You know, it's, it, it meant a ton. So I know that it would for me. So as you get into the, the day to days of being on the road, you know, you just find ways to exercise brain a little bit. And especially if it's going to mean a lot to somebody in that sense. So I'm going to, I'm going to credit Dio with uh, some of that inspiration to do that. It's a very cool sentiment. And Dale Carnegie, maybe you've heard about him, um, maybe you heard of him, but Dale Carnegie, the writer, he uh, he once said that someone's name is the sweetest sound that they'll ever hear. 
And that's, <laughs> oh, right on. that's a really cool gesture, dude. And uh, it is my wife. My wife, I'll say her name sometimes, and she she's all I just love it when you say my name, you know. So it's that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, maybe you just crank that uh, Destiny's Child uh, song, say my name, and I think you'd be... my name, say my name. <laughs> yeah. yeah, throw them in the jukebox for tonight's shift, man. I think it'll <laughs> turn some heads. <laughs> Um, but the blackened, you know, the blackening, excuse me, that record from 2007, uh, people talk about that record so much. You have such a, a vast, um, you know, musical background that you've been through. And that record seems to stand out when people talk about that. James jammed, James Hetfield jammed Aesthetics of Hate with you guys in Germany. You love Metallica, man. My God, yeah. you yeah. love them. <laughs> I fucking love Metallica, man. I do. I do. And, uh, I got the 07 shirt on, but awesome. Um, you know, yeah, this 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 podcast, Phil, um, began as me showing off my Metallica shit and right on travels and spent <laughs> 42 times around the world and craziness. But that's awesome, uh, man. Guitarists that that uh maybe influence you, I'm sure Hatfield's one of them. Um, any other guitarists that really influence your right hand and your signature? My right hand, uh, Gary Holt. Gary Holt, amazing right hand. Kara King's got a, an awesome right hand. Um, who else has a... Uh, uh, Jensen from The Haunted has a great right hand. You know, Rob Flynn has an amazing right hand. Um, who else? That's all I can think of right now. Yeah, people talk about Scott Ian of Anthrax too. Oh yeah, Scott's got a great Scott's got a great right hand. You know, solid solid player. I love that he he worships Malcolm Young. You know, the rhythm guy. You know, and Mal's amazing. Angus is the reason why I, I play guitar, but Malcolm is, you know, just the backbone and the foundation of that of that band, which is my favorite band. You love your Metallica. I love me some ACDC. Fuck yeah, man. Bon Scott era, of course, right? You know, mm -hmm. totally. But I love the Brian. I love the Brian songs too. Yeah, man. Um, the right hand is how you write your signature. And I think it was Richard Fortas who I had on that that said that Fieldy told him once that the hand you write with, that's your signature sound. And I think I like to say, oh, yeah. Phil, that you've got you've got that familiar sound, man. And uh um, all right on. Thank you, man. Yeah. Yeah, you covered Hallow Be Thy Name on the Blackening and, and oh. Battery, and those covers were really fucking pounding. But when you think of touring over the years, were there some tours that you mentioned Heaven and Hell and Metallica, but was there uh, maybe a night that stood out to you in your time with violence and Machine Head over the years that you just go to and it's like, wow, that, that happened? I think... Um... Yeah, there's a moment in uh, in Machine Head. We were playing uh, this this festival. I think they call it Rock and Rio, but it was actually in Lisbon, Portugal. And uh, I'd, I'd actually broken my leg, had a hairline fracture on my leg, jumping off this most ridiculous thing ever, a one foot riser. I kind of jumped off and I hit my shin. I fell and I hit my shin. This is with Metallica in... Uh, Katowice or some Poland in 2008 and uh five days later it's not healing it's swelling up and my whole leg is turning blue and you know I'm we're playing with Metallica in Rio and uh we uh <laughs> they the guys go you know we're thinking about playing how be thy name tonight for the first time you know and they're all hey why don't you use our jam room to practice it you know so we uh we go in their jam room and they're all outside. And of course we bust into battery and, you know, master of puppets and creeping death. And we hear this pounding on the, you know, outside and, you know, a couple of the guys cracked that, Hey, that's the, the best we've heard, you know, that, that song in time. And, and, you know, so many years, cause you know, Dave was playing it and whatever, but we go and we play how it be thy name for the first time. And there's just people going insane. Portugal is just so amazing. And they really get, you know, machine head at this point And, and, uh, and I remember playing that, you know, the wind is blowing on my hair and the crowd's going nuts. It's, it was my favorite 
Maiden song. It's one of my favorite songs of all time, you know, playing that. And it felt like I was in Maiden at that time, you know, and, and I was, I suggested that song to be covered and uh, to be able to, to do that in front of that crowd. That I think is my most rock and roll metal moment, live moment with that band. With violence, um, getting back together in 2019 and putting these shows together and having them sell out in minutes, you know, two shows, 2000 tickets sold super fast. And we played this punk punk rock venue locally that, you know, there's four par cans and we're going half stacks and jeans and t-shirts and, you know, no barricade and people jumping on stage. It just felt like 1986 all over again. And, you know, to, after all of that time to have people still care that much and, you know, for us to play those songs is, you know, it was pretty magical. Yeah, that sounds it, man. Holy shit. Uh, I've yet to see you live and I hope that that day will come very soon, you know, here in Western New York or, or what have you, but, uh, we're, uh, we're playing in, we're playing in New York. So we're, we're, we're playing in the city. I, we probably don't get down there that often, but I am playing the chance in Poughkeepsie with overkill in a couple of weeks. So. Oh, sick. Yeah. <laughs> Poughkeepsie. All right. Yeah. I'm going to look that up. Okay. Yeah. Wow. It's not um, Metallica, man. It's overkill, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> love it all, man. That's the shit. So, um, you know, just to switch gears here, I'm uh, on the I'm on the board of the American Foundation Suicide Prevention, and for every new subscriber, I make a donation of ten dollars to the foundation. I got my own page, you know, right down there. So okay. I think uh, it's been a it's been a, a definitely a topic that's been brought up more and more in in in, in a good way. So uh, it was actually recently I just found out that uh, Peter Robbins uh, passed away. He was the uh, voice actor for the original Charlie Brown. Oh man. Yeah. Passed away at 65. I think it was yesterday or the other day and, uh, oh, well. you know, suicide took his own life. And, um, you certainly count your blessings these days and there's no stigma on this podcast really. So I just have to ask you, uh, if you've been affected, uh, if you've lost someone to suicide and maybe how that has personally impacted you. I have it. Have I? Any musicians that maybe you admired that lost uh, drugs or, or, you know, short life? I know you mentioned ACDC with Bon Scott. Yeah, with Bon and Lane Staley, you know, and, and uh, I've had friends, you know, there's been crew members and, and friends in that sense that not by, you know, not by suicide in that sense, but by self-inflicted, you know, abuse, I guess, that maybe it wasn't their intent, but it definitely took their lives. So yeah, it's, it's hard, man. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's definitely okay to talk about it. Right. I mean, you mentioned Lane Staley and, 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 you know, what happened to Chris Cornell and Chester Bennington, that really taught me that depression has no face and uh, I'm no stranger to those thoughts definitely out of the woods in that respect, but it's, it's good. It's, it's good to get that out and talk about it uh, if need be. So, yeah, I agree with that. You know, we've all, I, you know, uh, battled depression in the past and recently or whatever it comes and goes. And it's, it's a joke, man. It is, it is overwhelming. And without being able to talk about it and without, without being able to, to share, um, then you know it's it could be devastating in a sense yeah well the, the metal keeps us young it keeps us having fucking sure. fun and um at age 33 and I, I off the bat i don't know how old you are you're probably you know, what 41 <laughs> i'll be i'll be 55 in a couple of months 55 you're looking good man looking good right on there. yeah giving it together <laughs> yeah but what a transition it was to come out of machine head you know you put so much time and 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 life into and now your slayer uh, asked you to come out uh to play for gary holt who was you know um aiding his dad who was who was struggling so how was that mm -hmm. experience and, and maybe some of the mental steps that you took to really just march forward for metal yeah yeah i mean i had quit the last 
I, I did a final tour with Machine Head and then, then just got home. And then the next day I got a call or got the text from, from Carrie to come out and do it. So it was going from, you know, leaving this career, 16 year career with this band. And then the next day stepping into something, you know, that was just monumental and just mammoth, just this huge, huge fucking deal, you know, and I felt honored. I felt vindicated. I felt, you know, a lot of, uh, it felt good to be wanted, you know, and, um, moving in and, and just learning the songs and, you know, stepping into that was so quick that, you know, I didn't have time to think about anything. I didn't have time to think about the band that I just left and all the, the time I had spent into that and the, all the emotions that that had in, it, in itself. And, uh, you know, since then there's been a lot of filling in things for, for other bands, you know, I'm filled in for my buddies in Nonpoint, play with them. Uh, you know, I play with the Metal Allegiance dudes. I uh, I just filled in with Lamb of God, and um, so Overkill. You know, it's uh, it's pretty cool to be the you know the hired gun and be able and able to step into these positions and have it be you know appreciated. Yeah, Randy Blythe, he's described his style as a, like a mountain ape up there on stage, just yelling, you know, like crazy. He's a funny guy, isn't he? Yeah, he's, he is. There's the, the, whole, the whole camp is, they're all unique individuals and, and uh, amazing in their own ways. And uh, it was an honor to, to step in and, and do, those, do those gigs. So uh, it's, it only makes me a better player, you know. I, I, all the stuff that I've t- taken on in these past few years has made me, you know, 10 times up the player I was three years ago. Yeah. All these opportunities are just going to keep coming. It sounds like man. And hey, they are man. More, more coming, more coming to BA, TBA, TBA. Yeah. All right. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll keep a lookout. We'll keep our ears yeah. open and Hey, maybe Angus Young just wants to take a break. And- <laughs> that, <laughs> that's no stepping into those shoes, man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, what are some of your songs that you would just, you know, yeah, just get in the pocket and, and, and rip. I love playing, uh, you know, every time I pick up an uptune guitar, I've got a, a, a Gibson V at home that I, I pick up and it's cause most of my, my guitars have the, the Floyd Rose on them, but this one's a fixed bridge and it's set up for that rock and roll, you know, uh, play kicked in the teeth, uh, beating around the bush. Um, you know, a lot of the Brian songs, because our cover band plays them, you know, so I'll play Shook Me All Night Long and um, uh, What Do You Do For Money, Honey, you know, Have a Drink On Me, Shoot the Thrill, I Love. That whole record is just flawless, you know, it's so fucking good. Yeah, yeah, it sure is. But yeah, to our viewers, the EP is called Let the World Burn, March the 4th, coming up. Can't wait to see it. Uh, Phil, you're coming to Poughkeepsie. Real estate work pending. It's starting to get a little busy, but if I could just, <laughs> cool. if I could just peace out and go see you, you know. No worries, man. Start about your bills, dude. I really wanted them to beat KC, you know. You know, 13 seconds for fuck's sake, you know. Just, oh. What the, what, what? <laughs> 13 seconds, you know, even last, last game or just last night, the Super Bowl is like, you know, just watch 13 seconds pass, you know, it was just. Yeah marching down, marching down the field. We were playing to lose, you know, with the guys to the edges there, you know? Yeah. That. Well, I'm a, you know, being a Raider fan, I don't know if you caught that Sunday night game against the Chargers that, you know, there was two minutes left and they had 19 plays. There was 19 plays in two minutes. It was the longest two minutes of my life. I told the wife when it was going to overtime, I was just like, I don't know how I can handle this. I don't know if I can fuck it because we, we, paused it and put the kids to bed so i was fast forwarding through the plays it's like just some fourth and 26 are you kidding me fourth and 18 are you kidding me you know stupid yeah. sports man. dude i was ra- i was rooting for your raiders too Derek carr he really uh he really wants it i could tell he does, wants man. It. and with their transition to vegas and then john gruden you know what happened yeah. there and for them just to keep on their tracks just keep going then, keep winning and then rugs 
Henry Ruggs killing that girl, drug driving, you know? Oh, yeah. I don't think I heard about that. Oh, shit. Yeah, he drunk driving, doing 150 miles an hour or something like that, and hammered out of his mind, killed somebody. That was our top receiver. And then one of our, our cornerbacks was waving a gun and threatening to kill people. It was like week after week. It's Gruden, Ruggs, Arnett. You know, what the fuck's going to happen this week? <laughs> well, well, guess what, Phil? Uh, Metallica are playing in Legion Stadium. <laughs> 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 what would oh, James think about this? Oh, James Hetfield once said that, you know. Yeah. But, uh, well, it's um, good talking to you, man. Yeah, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank yeah. you. And uh, to our viewers, you found a little value here. Uh, subscribe or like. It's always appreciated. But stay happy, stay healthy, stay hungry, and stay heavy. We'll see you, Phil. All right. Be well. Good talking to you, Kevin. You too, brother. Thanks. See you, buddy. Bye.